Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The results are out for the investigation into Governor Cuomo's alleged sexual harassment. President Biden and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi are now calling for the New York governor to resign. Vaccine passports are coming to New York City. Mayor Bill de Blasio announces that various indoor businesses will have to require proof of vaccination. But numerous Americans are pushing back, calling the policy tyrannical, discriminatory and divisive. With vaccinations and COVID cases both on the rise, Florida will not be shutting down. We bring you more from the governor on hospitalizations and his approach to defending Floridians from the virus. A Pentagon police officer is dead and several people are injured after a shooting and stabbing attack right outside of the Pentagon. The Pentagon insists the area is now secure after a two-hour lockdown. How vulnerable are federal agencies in the face of cyber attacks? A Senate report rates over 20 agencies and NASA has one of the lowest scores. An independent, months-long investigation finds that New York Governor Andrew Cuomo sexually harassed multiple women. The governor denies any wrongdoing and gives no indication he's stepping down. This as President Biden and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi call for his resignation. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. New York Attorney General Letitia James announced the findings of the investigation in which 11 women reported sexual harassment against Governor Cuomo. The independent investigation has concluded that Governor Andrew Cuomo sexually harassed multiple women and in doing so violated federal and state law. Attorneys June Kim and Dan Clark led the probe. The governor's pattern of sexually harassing behavior was not limited to members of his own staff, but extended to other state employees, including a state trooper who served on his protective detail. Some suffered through unwanted touching and grabbing of their most intimate body parts. Others suffered through repeated offensive, sexually suggestive, or gender-based comments. A number of them endured both. Kim also said the governor's top aides did not follow their own rules for reporting sexual harassment and neglected to properly follow through when sexual harassment was reported. It was a culture where you could not say no to the governor. And if you, and if you upset him or, his, him or his senior staff, you would be written off, cast aside, or worse. Clark described one of the women's interactions with Cuomo. He then asked her how much of an age difference he thought he could have between him and a girlfriend and have the public still accept it. She suggested it might be a good idea to stick with women at least as old as your daughters. Cuomo says he now understands that there are cultural and generational perspectives that he had not fully appreciated. Another woman stated that I kissed her on the forehead at our Christmas party and that I said, ciao, Bella. Now, I don't remember doing it, but I'm sure that I did. I do kiss people on the forehead. I do kiss people on the cheek. Although this investigation is civil and there will be no criminal consequences, the report has been made public so any police departments or prosecutors can look at the evidence and determine if they would like to take further action. Jason Perry, NCD News, New York. 70% of American adults have gotten at least one COVID-19 vaccination. And the U.S. is now shipping millions of doses to low-income countries more than all other countries are donating combined. NTD's Lin Lin has the details. The U.S. has shipped more than 110 million vaccine doses to 65 countries worldwide. According to the United Nations, this is more than the donations of all 24 countries that have donated any vaccine to other countries including China and Russia. In June, President Biden promised to donate 500 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine to nearly 100 of the poorest countries, no strings attached. It will cost the U.S. $3.5 billion, even with a non-for-profit discount from Pfizer. 
With the recent rise in domestic CCP virus cases, Biden reinstates vaccine requirements for federal workers and welcomes more private sectors to join. I want to thank Walmart, Google, Netflix, Disney, Tyson Foods for the recent actions requiring vaccination for employees. New York City will soon require proof of vaccination for indoor activities. Biden expressed support for the move, but when asked about a vaccine passport, he replied, I don't think they need to do that. I think they just need to give the authority of those restaurants or businesses to say, in order to come in, you have to give proof that you've been vaccinated or that you can't come in. On Monday, 70 percent of American adults had gotten at least one shot, which is about a one-month delay from Biden's original goal. Lin Lin, NTD News. New York City is set to become the first city in the U.S. to mandate proof of COVID-19 vaccination in order to enter various indoor businesses. But the new policy is sparking outrage, with many people calling it tyrannical. NTD's Grace Coulter has the story. Today, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio told New Yorkers, If you want to participate in our society fully, you got to get vaccinated. He announced Tuesday that the city will be mandating proof of COVID-19 vaccination for indoor businesses such as restaurants, gyms, and entertainment venues. This approach is going to make clear, you want to enjoy everything great in this summer of New York City? Go get vaccinated. It will do for you so many things. It will make your life better. It will make all our lives better. However, he emphasized if you're unvaccinated, unfortunately, you will not be able to participate in many things. The program, dubbed Key to NYC Pass, will be implemented mid-August during a transition period before it's fully enforced starting September 13th. Online, de Blasio's announcement sparked instant outrage, with a number of people calling the move tyrannical and raising concerns about where so much government control is heading. News analyst Anomaly said on Twitter, this doesn't end with a vaccine passport in New York City. If you keep caving, it's going to get worse and you're going to be stuck this way forever. Author and veteran journalist Lee Smith said the purpose of the new mandate isn't to incentivize vaccination, but to continue a brutal campaign against New York City's small businesses. He further wrote, COVID regulations have nothing to do with public health. They are all political measures targeting the oligarchy's enemies, in particular small businesses. As New York City has now made clear, the vaccine, like lockdowns, etc., is simply a political instrument. A number of people called the policy divisive and discriminatory, including independent journalist Jordan Skatchel, who said in a tweet, The purpose here is discrimination, not health. They want to exclude people from society that they label as inferior. If the vax works, this is unnecessary. If the vax doesn't work, this is pointless. The policy is segregation, plain and simple. Numerous people are also raising concerns that the mandate could disproportionately impact people of color, since according to the CDC, only 31 percent of black New Yorkers are fully vaccinated. Some conservatives and libertarians are calling for protests against the mandate. Over the last couple of weeks, multiple large-scale protests have taken place across Europe, including in France and Italy, over similar types of vaccine passports. Grace Coulter, NTD News. So how will the vaccine mandate affect New York City's businesses? 40% of all New Yorkers are still not fully vaccinated. Will businesses survive turning away that many customers? NTD's Phil Zo has the story. How are businesses responding to New York City's vaccination mandate for indoor venues? that that is probably a wise move with the rising of cases and again it's not it's not a political thing we're doing it out of purely uh safety reasons but some people don't trust the vaccine yet i i think some very smart people are not in favor of vaccination one business owner foresaw the future we actually announced last night on our social media accounts that we'll be requiring proof of vaccination to get into all of our shows. Uh, so we're going to do that anyways, even without uh, the mayor's announcement. Zodan says one reason is for the safety of his workers. Uh, we actually had a comic last week that tested positive for Delta. And after he tested positive, we had a few staff members that didn't feel comfortable working. At the Chelsea Bell restaurant in New York, 
The manager says they will follow the mandate. Vaccination is not the course for you. Unfortunately, you can't come inside. If that's what de Blasio and wants us to do, then we have to follow those rules. Ogo says the mandate will probably hurt business, but they have no choice. She says customers are still welcome to dine outdoors. I mean, we definitely don't want to turn anybody away, but if we have to because of the vaccination mandate, you know, unfortunately, that's just what we have to do at the moment. But one customer says the mandate is not fair. We're being forced to, uh, you know, be vaccinated. Um, and if you don't, you know, you can't come into, you know, the stadiums, the, the restaurants, the bars. Uh, you can only eat indoor, uh, outdoors, not indoors. So I think it's a little unfair. Alex says people should have a choice to make their own decisions. Everybody makes their own, uh, you know, opinions. Everybody does, they know their bodies better than anybody else. New York City's mayor says the city is creating the key to New York City Pass to provide proof of vaccination. Phil Zo, NTD News. Over 8 million people live in New York City. Over the past month, the average number of COVID deaths per day was less than five. Many are left wondering why the city is doubling down on vaccinations. NTD's Arian Pazdar asked New Yorkers how they feel about the looming vaccine mandate. Around 60% of New Yorkers have been vaccinated so far, so that's just about half. Now, when we asked people about the new rule, we got similar results. Around half of them were actually in favor of it. I think that's great. I think it's safe and it's, everybody can only benefit from it. I have nothing to lose. What about people who don't want to get vaccinated? Are they also going to benefit from it? I think it's really inconsiderate of them not to get vaccinated. Do you think there should be an option for testing instead, or do you think it's, it's the right way to go to just require a vaccine? No, all have to get. All have to get the vaccine. No way. There is no way. Do you think weekly testing should be another option instead of getting no, vaccinated? It's not always accurate. But are vaccines always protect? Do they always guarantee protection? Um, yeah. I mean, it's a science. Just read up on it. What about Lindsey Graham, who just had a breakthrough case? That I don't know anything about. Get vaccinated. Save us all. Now there's also the other half of New Yorkers, of course, and they don't really appreciate the mandate. It's just another way to control everybody. It's kind of pathetic. The mayor is saying that if you're not vaccinated, he literally said you cannot enjoy a lot of things that the city has to offer. You have to get vaccinated to enjoy these things. Well, we are not in third world country. They are dictatorships. They say, you do it my way or no way. Okay. They did before. They locked down the home. Telling people what to do, it's like you're Nazis, you know what I mean? It's like you're being indoctrinated. You have to do this, you have to do that. That's not what we were built on. The vaccination is not FDA approved. So if it's not FDA approved, why should I have to get it? Erin Pastar, NTD News, New York. And as New York tries to pressure Americans into getting vaccinated, a teacher's union says it opposes mandates for staff. This union represents over 600,000 active and retired workers. NTD's Miguel Moreno has that story. General Lieber. Governor Andrew Cuomo has urged school districts to require teachers to get vaccinated if they want to teach. But a teachers union in New York says they oppose COVID-19 vaccine mandates for K-12 through staff. In a statement, New York State Unified Teachers showed support for on-site, no-cost testing, but said... What we have not supported is a vaccine mandate. In colleges and universities, the push to vaccinate against COVID has met with resistance. But teachers seem to have more leeway. Like at Cornell University in New York, students must vaccinate against COVID. Teachers can turn it down. Same with CUNY. Students must vaccinate. Teachers have the option. Cuomo says he'll require state workers to get vaccinated, but that doesn't include public school teachers. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Florida will not be shutting down. The decision comes after a surge in COVID cases in the state, with about half of the state's population vaccinated. The governor made the announcement today, saying he expects cases to drop in the coming weeks. Here's NTD's Kevin Hogan with more. Hospital uh, admissions have slowed. I don't Florida's think Governor Ron DeSantis said that COVID hospitalizations in his state are lessening and that the state will not shut down. It comes as the Delta variant has caused a surge in cases across the country, and Florida had over 21,000 new cases of the virus on Saturday, which broke the state's record. We're not shutting down. 
Uh, we're going to have schools open. We're protecting every Floridian's job in this state. We're protecting people's small businesses. Health and Human Services data shows that Florida hospitals are treating over 11,000 COVID patients with about 2,400 of them in the ICU. DeSantis said his state's hospitals are open for business and that ones in Jackson have half as many COVID patients as last year. The governor claimed that fear-mongering propagated by some media outlets led to additional harm in March 2020, and he said he doesn't want to see a repeat of that. There was a huge decline in people who would show up to the ED. Literally, people are having heart, uh, heart attacks at home because they thought that there weren't either not enough room in the hospital or they thought that they would get COVID and die as a result of that. So we don't want to follow that. This week, 409 people have died from COVID in Florida, bringing the state's death toll to over 39,000. DeSantis said the state's best defense against the virus is natural immunity that builds up over time and vaccinating vulnerable seniors first. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. As the Delta variant surges across the country, the demand for masks could go up quickly. However, the domestic mask industry is in danger of going broke. One of the main reasons, unfair competition from China. The American Mask Manufacturers Association, AMMA, warned recently that the U.S. may soon lose its mask manufacturing capabilities. The group says that immediate federal intervention is necessary in order to keep this key national security supply chain alive. The industry group reports that it quickly built up its manufacturing capacity and added nearly 8,000 new jobs when the CCP virus broke out last year. But by the end of June, over 5,000 employees have been laid off and several companies have stopped producing masks here in the U.S. AMMA is concerned that China's dumping practices are threatening the U.S. supply chain. Chinese masks cost just a fraction of American-made ones. State and local governments, as well as private companies, are now relying on foreign suppliers. AMMA says this dependence represents a national security threat. The group is pushing the Biden administration to buy more U.S.-made masks to boost the strategic national stockpile and save the industry. In addition, it's urging Congress to impose stricter safety standards on masks, specifically those that are purchased by state and local governments, schools and hospitals. It has also filed a petition with the World Trade Organization to take action against China for anti-competitive business practices. A top Democratic strategist is being criticized for her tweet about Senator Lindsey Graham contracting the CCP virus. She apologized today. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham started having mild flu-like symptoms Saturday night and then went to the doctor. The 66-year-old lawmaker said on Monday he had tested positive for the CCP virus even after being vaccinated. Graham will be quarantining for 10 days. Kate Coyne McCoy wrote in a tweet about Graham, it's wrong to hope he dies from COVID, right? Asking for a friend. Coyne McCoy is the chief strategist of the Rhode Island Democratic Party. She was quickly criticized for her tweet. Rhode Island House Minority Leader Blake Filippi tweeted, if the Rhode Island GOP chairwoman or any Rhode Island GOP official were to say anything like this, I would immediately and publicly demand their resignation. Coyne McCoy apologized Tuesday morning. She said in a tweet, I used poor judgment, which I obviously regret. A Pentagon police officer is dead and several people are in hospital with injuries after a shooting and stabbing attack just steps from the Pentagon building this morning. NTD's Melina Weiskup has more updates on the incident. We're here right outside of the Pentagon where the shooting incident was reported at around 1030 this morning. Immediately after the incident, the Pentagon told the public to steer clear of the area and they completely locked down the Pentagon building as well as surrounding areas. Even the parking lot here where I'm standing was blocked off to traffic. A police officer was attacked at the metro station platform right across from the Pentagon building. The suspect stabbed and fired shots at the officer. The anonymous official also told the Associated Press that a police officer shot and killed the suspect, but the Pentagon has also refused to confirm this. An eyewitness filmed what appeared to be CPR being done on two people at the scene. Several were injured, but their conditions are unclear as of late Tuesday afternoon. The incident is, is over, the scene is secure, and most importantly, there's no continuing threat to our community. The Pentagon lifted the lockdown around the building at noon, and police are not looking for another suspect. 
Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was at the White House meeting with President Biden when the shooting happened, and he later returned to the Pentagon. He did have a chance to visit the, the Pentagon Police Operations Center when he returned uh, to check in with them um, and to express his gratitude for everything they're doing. The FBI is now investigating the shooting, including looking into the motive of the attack. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. You may have heard a lot about recent cyber attacks targeting government agencies, but just how vulnerable are those agencies? According to a new state report, their average cybersecurity score is only a C-. Senators Rob Portman and Gary Peters released a bipartisan report Tuesday on cybersecurity in the federal government. The report from the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee rated 14 cabinet departments and nine independent agencies. The average overall cybersecurity score is C minus, with five departments getting a D. The Departments of State, Commerce, Education, Transportation, and Veterans Affairs. Three independent agencies also got a D. NASA, the Social Security Administration, and the Office of Personnel Management. The report found that seven agencies failed to comply with basic requirements in the Federal Information Security Modernization Act. Other findings showed that some agencies were using legacy systems no longer supported by the vendor, and some were failing to adequately protect personally identifiable information. Portman says it is unacceptable that our own federal agencies are not doing everything possible to safeguard America's data. The bipartisan pair made several suggestions, including a more coordinated federal approach to cybersecurity. A whole airline crew is suspended after duct taping a man to his seat during a flight. The passenger is seen yelling and fighting the crew in a video that went viral. NTD's Miguel Moreno has the details. That's 22-year-old Maxwell Berry seen yelling in this video gone viral, uploaded by ABC News. The video also shows Berry fighting with the Frontier airline crew. And out comes the duct tape. Reports say this happened over the weekend. The Miami-Dade Police Department told The Hill that Barry was intoxicated. In a statement, Frontier Airlines said he inappropriately touched two female flight attendants and assaulted a male flight attendant. The crew was put on paid leave. Frontier Airlines said, unfortunately, the proper policies for restraining a passenger were not followed. As a result, the flight attendants involved have been suspended pending further investigation. Neither the police department nor the airline company have gotten back to us. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Coming up, two more gold medals for Team USA at the Olympics today. One of them from an event that no American has won in more than half a century. And an app allows pool owners to rent out their pools to eager customers looking for a break from the heat. The app's co-founder explains his foray into the sharing economy. As we continue our updates on the Olympic Games in Tokyo, a runner and a wrestler make American history by winning gold. And Simone Biles wins her first and only individual event medal. In track and field, a historic moment for Team USA. No American has won any medal in the women's 800-meter event since 1988, and no gold medal in more than half a century. But this time in Tokyo, not one, but two Americans made it to the podium. 19-year-old Athing Mo broke the national record and became the first American to win gold in this event since 1968. And Raven Rogers won the bronze. And in wrestling, Tamira Mensa Stock became the second American woman to win gold in Olympic history. She beat her Nigerian opponent in 68kg freestyle wrestling on Tuesday. The 28-year-old jumped up and down with tears of joy and said, I love representing the U.S. I love living here. I love it. I'm so happy I get to represent USA. And in gymnastics, Simon Biles completed in her only individual event, the balance beam, on Tuesday. She's taking home a bronze medal, finishing behind two Chinese athletes. She had also won bronze in this event at the Rio Olympics five years ago. And an update on the Belarusian runner who sought asylum at the Polish embassy in Tokyo. The Polish government plans to fly her to Warsaw as soon as possible. 
The International Olympic Committee is investigating the case and they are expecting the Belarusian Olympic Committee to report back to them. And as summer continues to heat up, an app is allowing people to rent out their swimming pools, connecting them with eager customers looking for a cool reprieve. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. An inflatable pink flamingo floats leisurely, surrounded by plants on the pool deck. Carmen Sanchez rents this backyard oasis by the hour on the website Swimply. Swimply calls itself the Airbnb of private swimming pools and has joined what's now known as the sharing economy. Sanchez began renting her swimming pool last May after learning about the website from a friend. At first, I was a little reluctant because I said, oh, I, you know, I don't know who's coming. I, I, I want to make sure they feel comfortable and I feel comfortable. But it's been the best experience to have someone enjoy my home as much as me and make it feel like their own is something very special. Sanchez lives in Queens, but people come to her home from all over New York City to relax in the sun. She rents her pool for $75 an hour and says she can earn about $8,000 a month. Usually I get a lot of renters from the city who are living in apartment buildings and or in homes with probably no backyards. And they come here and they have a wonderful time. They call it a staycation, yes. Asher Weinberger and Bunham Laskin are the minds behind Swimply. The duo started in 2018 by offering Laskin's neighbors in New Jersey access to their swimming pools for a fee. Our vision really is the extension of the sharing economy beyond the functional, right? The sharing economy, Uber, Airbnb, very functional. Hospitality, transportation, things you need every single day. What we're trying to do is to extend the sharing economy to the experiential, the things you want to do, to give you a feeling of luxury, a feeling that of a lifestyle that you couldn't necessarily afford, but now you can, right? That's what we're trying to do. It's an extension of the sharing economy. That idea grew into a web-based booking platform. It now offers access to about 15,000 pools in the United States, Canada, and Australia. Swimply takes a 15% profit from hosts and another 10% from guests. There are safety and hygiene guidelines. Swimply conducts site inspections and offers hosts liability insurance. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. How prepared is your family if a tornado shows up at your doorstep, or a flood, or a hurricane? You can't just turn away a natural disaster. That's why it's important to go to ready.gov slash plan now. It has the tools and tips you need to make an emergency plan with your family. So if disaster comes knocking, let's go. You'll be ready to help keep your family safe. It's just a pizza. Yes. Make a plan today.
A board of supervisors on the West Coast plan to close a local airport by 2031, or maybe even sooner. NTD's David Lamb speaks with a pilot who says the airport should stay as it helps the community and can build careers. The Reed Hillview Airport is at risk of closing down within 10 years. Some city officials say that the planes use fuel that can lead to lead exposure in children. The planes currently use leaded fuel, but there are calls to switch to unleaded. An initiative group is trying to save the airport from closing. On its website, Save Reed Hillview Airport, it says that pilots and operators are most highly exposed. The county and health officials say the area around the airport is of concern due to the number of schools, and children are likely to ingest things through their mouths. Their bodies are just very efficient at, at um, drawing lead into their bodies. And so, you know, one of the reasons we're so concerned about this is that we recognize that we have so many children that live in this community. The Save Reed Hillview group is trying to do its part by switching from leaded aviation gas to unleaded. One of their goals is encouraging political leaders to help bring unleaded fuel to the airports, as there is only one manufacturer of unleaded aviation fuel. Uh, I know the county has specified uh, lead contamination because these planes, a lot of them do use um, leaded fuel. Frankie Castillo is a second generation pilot and doctor and part of this airport since 1985. However, several studies, studies I've seen actually out of Chicago have actually stated that it's very, very minimal. Um, I think what's happened over the years is there has been urbanization around the airport and because of that, there's noise abatement, there's just complaints from several residents in the area that want the airport closed. Dr. Castillo and his team uses the planes here to provide dental services to those in need, locally and out of the country. He says they tend to fly out to the southern border twice a year to help people out of kindness. I've seen over the years, over the decades, how this airport has slowly been depleting. Several of the planes have no longer been here. Pilots have actually flown out of state. Dr. Castillo says the airport is an important part of San Jose and he urges other pilots and community members to take a stand. David Lau, NTD News, California. A mansion in Los Angeles, California is selling for millions of dollars. The estate is currently owned by one of the Osama bin Laden brothers. Here's NTD's Cynthia Kai with details and photos of the estate. For the first time in 20 years, a mansion in Los Angeles, California's Bel Air neighborhood is being listed for sale. The two-acre estate belongs to Ibrahim bin Laden, an older brother of Osama bin Laden. According to Realtor.com, the property is selling for $28 million, based on land value only. Ibrahim bought the house in 1983 for $1.6 million, which equals approximately $5.5 million today. According to a report by Vanity Fair, Ibrahim has not lived in the mansion for 20 years. During the September 11, 2001 terror attacks, he was vacationing abroad and never returned due to the notoriety of his last name. Photos on Realtor.com reveal the mansion has entered a state of neglect and disrepair. Remnants of the former gardens still exist, though most of the plants are long dead. Stone fountains are empty, but several tall palm trees are thriving and the swimming pool and spa appear to be intact. Currently, there are no photos of the interior. Codewell Banker Realty, the broker for the property, did not respond to NTD's request for a comment. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. Coming up, Chinese Communist authorities blow open a dam. It floods the nearby villages but protects wealthier areas. And they call back rescue teams saying it's due to the pandemic. And the flood is not over yet. Farmers are struggling to survive after northern China's crop fields and livestock farms are left in ruins. More soon here on NTD News. A dam in China was exploded open and floods rushed into the villages, pushing residents into a desperate situation. Local officials have ordered all rescue teams to leave the flooded areas, citing the pandemic. A dam protecting a town in central China has been exploded open. To protect wealthier areas from extreme flooding, the communist regime typically sacrifices poor areas. They call these areas flood discharge zones. 
Wangzhong town in Henan province is one of these zones. A dam nearby was exploded open over the weekend to ease the flood pressure on other areas. Wangzhong town and some other towns are now submerged. When you see this, you may think this is a sea. Actually, this is Xiaohe town, the home of 73,000 people from 62 villages. What makes the matter worse, the local authorities were ordered to clear out all rescue teams in the name of the CCP virus pandemic. A civilian rescue team is still striving to save more villagers, but it's getting harder due to a lack of supplies. We're desperate for a helping hand to assist us here in Chun County. The flooded area is in urgent need of disinfection facilities, equipment and supplies. A reporter from a Chinese online news outlet was with the team. She sobbed in front of the camera, saying they would run out of drinking water in a few days. It's worth noting that all of them are asking the Chinese people for help, with no mention of the authorities. The submerged county is renowned for its quality croplands, most of which is now submerged as a swamp. China's flood season isn't over yet, and an epidemic already seems to be around the corner. Flood-hit Chinese counties are asking for donations of disinfectant to try to clean up their environment, which is now polluted by dead livestock. And just a warning, some viewers may find the following footage disturbing due to its graphic nature. Counties in China's flood-hit Hunan province sent out an SOS online. They're asking for disinfectant to help clean up pathogens from dead livestock on local farms. In Weishu County, more than 150,000 rotting carcasses remain in the water after floods hit weeks ago. Many fear it could trigger a potential outbreak of contagious diseases. Sure. The smell is terrible. County villager Wang Shi told the Epoch Times the locals clearing the rotting carcasses were choking on the odor. To protect his identity, we gave him a pseudonym. The government will send dozens of rescuers after our village chief strongly requested it, but it's already too late to salvage the dead livestock now. The widespread floods destroyed thousands of livestock farms across the province, as well as the locals' livelihoods. More than a million animals died. In many villages, dead pigs are seen lying, bloated in the water. Villagers tied their dead bodies together to stop them from floating away. Last week, Wang's Villages Committee posted a letter on Chinese social media. It says four pig farms in the village were flooded and more than 6,000 dead pigs could not be salvaged. In one sentence, the letter reads, the stench is so bad that they are about to rot. The village committee urgently appealed to all levels of the regime for help, from disposing of the dead pigs to aerial disinfection and epidemic prevention. At the end of the letter, the words read, urgent, urgent, urgent. As for local livestock farm owners, Wang says their loss is so big they don't want to live anymore. Our county has four pig farms. The biggest one had 5,000 pigs. The rest had about 3,000 pigs. Floodwaters hit these farms all of a sudden. They couldn't relocate. Floods wiped out the whole pigsty and water reached to almost 80 inches there. Wang says the pigs lived for about three days in the water. Then they died. It's been 10 days now. They are all dead. None of them left. Wang says the total loss in his village is over $6 million, which is a huge amount of money for villagers in China's rural areas. We borrowed millions of dollars to raise those pigs, and it's all wasted. We can't even survive. So far, the local government has not said whether it will provide financial compensation to the victims. Coming up, censorship and cancel culture getting in the way of open scientific discussions. One public health expert in Belgium got fired after questioning lockdown measures. We hear his story. And self-healing spacecraft. Sounds like sci-fi, but a group of scientists in the UK are working on making it happen. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News.
Hi folks, Joe Namath here with a new message about your Medicare benefits. You may be entitled to transportation, meals, and expanded coverage for dental work that includes extractions, fillings, and dentures, all at no additional cost. Plus, depending on your zip code, you may be entitled to the Medicare benefit that adds money to your Social Security check every single month. Call and get everything you deserve. Call now. It's free. I'm on a fixed income, so I called to get money added to my Social Security check. They helped me so much. I called to save money on co-pays, get prescriptions, transportation, and my dental work covered. I couldn't believe I was spending money I don't have to spend. Millions of people have trusted the Medicare coverage helpline, and you can too. Call now. It's free. Call 1-800-764-1930. That's 1-800-764-1930 now. Some academics say they've experienced a form of cancel culture, including censorship on social media and even losing their job. NTD's Jane Werrell speaks with a health expert in Belgium who was labeled an anti-vaxxer, then got fired. There are growing concerns over the censorship of debate around lockdown and vaccination policies. A public health expert in Belgium tells us he lost his job after questioning the measures. He's as concerned about the effect the censorship could have on open scientific discussions. Normally, if we look at science, you have thesis, antithesis, and you come to a synthesis. And this is the basis of science, you know, not everybody has to agree. That's what, what keeps science progressing, that's what keeps science growing, and that's uh, what we need to keep evolving in science, you know, you need debate, you need to discuss with each other, you need to discuss different viewpoints, and this leads to new, th new ways of thinking. He wrote an open letter last August signed by more than 1,500 people in the medical and scientific field, saying the lockdown policy was a disproportionate response to the virus. It called for a double-up approach to vaccinate the elderly and people with underlying health conditions and to have the virus circulate among the healthy population to achieve natural or herd immunity. It's similar to a petition spearheaded two months later by UK and US scientists called the Great Barrington Declaration, which was signed by more than 14,000 medical and public health scientists. Earlier this year, Brockham made newspaper headlines following a national TV debate. He questioned an expert who said vaccinated people are unable to transmit the virus. He says his university came under pressure and it led him to be fired. Uh, well, what happened was I questioned this uh, during the debate and the debate was foreseen to be t uh, taking 25 minutes and I was there for the last two teams. Well, we reached the third team and uh, suddenly uh, the, the, the program was stopped and uh, a debate was stopped, ended, and uh, I didn't even get to the points that I was invited for in the debate. And that was it. And the next day I was all over the press and I uh, was put aside as an anti-vaxxer, which I'm not. My children are vaccinated for every child vaccine they ever needed. Uh, same for me. Um, but in this case, uh, I. We also had doubts about the, the speed in which the vaccines were developed. Uh, we had a lot of concerns. We still have today. It's been difficult to bring similar concerns to the fore in the UK. Toby Young, who co-founded the Free Speech Union and is associate editor of The Spectator, says the attempts of censorship in science are alarming. So... Professors who've expressed dissenting points of view about lockdown, people like Michael Levitt, Shunetra Gupta, Carl Hennigan, um, Jay Bhattacharya, they found themselves not quite cancelled, though I think in Michael Levitt's case he actually, an invitation to attend a conference was withdrawn, but sometimes their YouTube videos have been removed by YouTube, their accounts have been suspended by Twitter, a piece written by Carl Hennigan and Tom Jefferson for The Spectator about the Danish mask study um, was flagged as um, inaccurate on Facebook. And we've seen um, the very weapons used to silence dissenters in other areas now being deployed to silence dissenters within the hard sciences. And that's a really alarming development, I think. 
Freedom of speech is critical to healthy debate, but it's something that's been lacking when talking about pandemic restrictions. Many people will be hoping for more open debates as we emerge from this crisis in the months and weeks ahead. Jane Warrell, NTD News, London. Shuttles made from self-healing materials. That may sound like the subject of a sci-fi movie, but a group of scientists in Bristol are working on a new generation of spacecraft. NTD's Natalia Nutting has the story. It looks so peaceful up in space, but it's not. Low Earth orbit is a hostile environment. Any craft up here faces collisions from space junk and meteoroids. Scientists in Bristol are working on new materials that can withstand the rigors of space. Part of doing this program is to test this combination of resin and fiber to see what can work in that environment and give us the kind of durability and performance that we're looking for. The new material needs to be light to save fuel, and they need to age less quickly. Atomic oxygen creates a big challenge as it erodes surfaces. The researchers have tackled this using polymer that reacts with oxygen to create a protective layer, effectively healing itself. What we have is, is a polymer that essentially self-heals. So when we expose it in the, in, in the low Earth orbit environment, the material reacts with the oxygen, re reacts with these radicals, and essentially produces a shell over its surface. So it becomes almost like a protective carapace over the surface of the polymer. So it protects what's underneath. The polymer is just millimeters thick, but Hamilton says it can be used for the structures of spacecraft and satellites. The scientists want to move away from transporting metal parts into space. They want to build new craft from raw materials out in space. If you can send up your, your resin and your fiber and actually start manufacturing those composite structures in space, it opens up a world of possibilities of building very large, complex structures that are very durable, strong and lightweight. And then you're not constrained by the actual launch vehicle payload bay. Engine start and liftoff. Next spring, the material will be sent to the International Space Station, where researchers will measure in real time how it ages. It won't be the final frontier, but these early steps could herald a new generation of spacecraft. Natalia Nutting, NTD News. Following thousands showing up at banned protests in Berlin and mass arrests, the Epoch Times spoke with the founder of the largest anti-lockdown group in Germany. He says in the capital, the government uses excuses to ban protests critical of its policies. NTD's Trevor Piper has more on this. Berlin police say 5,000 people showed up for banned protests against forced vaccination and for basic rights on Sunday. Michael Balweg, on the other hand, estimates that up to 200,000 people came to Berlin. He's the founder of the largest anti-lockdown group in Germany called Queerdenken, or lateral thinking. The courts argued the protests would endanger public health since attendees were expected to break hygiene rules. Balweg disagrees. Uh, in, Berlin. in Berlin it is actually the case that if it is critical of the government, it is also banned. Police say the banned protests led to multiple clashes, almost 1,000 arrests and 75 injured officers. One protester died from a heart attack during an arrest. Prior to the ban, Balweg's group had registered the largest protest, with over 22,000 expected to attend. Six other protests were banned too. Fadenscheinigen Argument aus meiner Sicht ja verboten. In my view, protests are banned with a flimsy argument because the content is what it's all about, and the content is simply criticism of the government. A spokesperson for the Interior Ministry on Monday defended the ban. We have also always had this experience in the Office for the Protection of the Constitution that right-wing extremists try to appropriate these events for themselves. Fortunately, they haven't quite succeeded yet. Balweg says he feels divisions in Germany have lessened. In my experience in Berlin, I don't experience such a big social division anymore. And that is perhaps also the reason why the federal government is taking such massive action against lateral thinkers, freedom-loving people, fundamental rights, advocates, whatever you want to call them. He says this is in contrast to the official narrative conveyed by the media. Trevor Piper, NTD News. As a naval destroyer, the USS Ross conducts exercises on the Black Sea. Good food makes up for the constant training and combat missions. 
and the galley mission readiness is on the front burner. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. Sailors aboard the USS Ross eat four meals a day, and their diet is prepared carefully ahead of time. Stocked with maximum food supplies, the ship's reserves last for 45 days. To replenish provisions, the Navy delivers food and goods to the ship and others like it. But occasionally, something is approved in countries where the ship is stationed. In that case, the cooks prepare a special dinner. We're in the galley, so this is where we're making all the preps to feed 300 people for uh, Mongolian barbecue tonight. Uh, these are culinary specialists over here. They're working extremely hard. They do this four times a day, every single day. They don't get any days off. They're working their extremely hard just to make everybody happy. On some days, the food may be ordinary, and on others, special dishes are prepared. On the USS Ross, it's typically hot dog rolls on Tuesdays, Wednesdays it's ice cream, on Thursdays barbecue, and on Sunday steak or lobster. Every once in a while when you enter a new uh, area of operation, there's a, sometimes a different catalog which will provide us with the ability to get new uh, food products, and so we try mixing it up as much as possible. Uh, in order to keep everybody happy and keep feeding them. Up to 10 people work in the galley at the same time. While some cook and immediately serve lunch, other chefs are already preparing dinner. All work is carefully assigned and coordinated, and one chef is assigned to each menu item. To feed 300 people at the same time, there can't be any hiccups. Food makes us happy. It makes us happy to be here. Even though we're so far away from home, away from our families, away from our ways of life, food makes us happy, brings us together, makes us stronger, and allows us to do the things that we, we need to do. In early July, the USS Ross took part in Black Sea drills involving dozens of NATO and Ukrainian warships, serving as a two-week show of force. That's following a confrontation between Russian military forces and a British destroyer off Crimea. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And a story to lift the spirits now. The last species of truly wild horses gave birth last month at a zoo in Bedfordshire. The foal of this rare and endangered species is now finding its feet. It was born on the 17th of July and is just beginning to explore its surroundings with its mother, Charlotte. The Chevalsky is the only species of horse considered truly wild, as it is not descended from domesticated horses. These horses, bred at Whipsnade Zoo, were successfully reintroduced to Mongolia to save the then extinct in the wild species. The Zoological Society of London says there are now hundreds of wild Chevalsky horses living in Mongolia, Ukraine and China, and their population is increasing. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.
We have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source.